Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> can you hear me? So here you can. And the online, can you hear me? You can check it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm uh, very happy to welcome uh, you today. A uh, special uh, warm welcome for our panelists <laughs> uh, and all the participants. Uh, some are coming uh, from Paris, some are coming from Switzerland, uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, so all over the Europe, let's say. Uh, so we should be around uh, 60, 70 people uh, here in the room and uh, the people uh, watching uh, us are building up uh, online. So we probably should be uh, over 100 uh, people uh, by the time uh, we, we start and start the, the debates. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> really uh, good. <laughs> Um, so I'm very happy to, to welcome our speakers. Um, they are all very well-known uh, key opinion leaders uh, from uh, both the microfluidic worlds and the uh, organ on a chip uh, applications. Uh, they are coming from uh, various uh, horizons, uh, academia, industry, startups, uh, big pharma, CROs, um, and also from uh, various countries, from France, from UK, from Germany, from uh, Switzerland. So we have a very interesting uh, panel today. Uh, and so big thank you for us for being here today, uh, for adjusting your travel plans uh, to be with us. So it's really appreciated. Uh, I would also like uh, to thank the Fluidgen team who make it uh, possible. Uh, so our chef d'orchestre was uh, Arnaud, uh, well supported by uh, all the marketing team and also our product and project manager, uh, Bruno, Adam, uh, William and Nicolas that uh, you will uh, see uh, more later on with uh, some teasing. Uh, I won't spoil uh, the surprise yet. So welcome. Uh, let's uh, let's start the discussion with our first uh, panel uh, about microfluidic, and I will leave the floor to Serge, uh, who is going to be the moderator of the first uh, panel. Thank you. So uh, let's start with um, with our first uh, panel. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Valérie Tali, uh, research director at uh, CNRS. Uh, Dr. Claudia Gardner, uh, CEO at uh, Nico, uh, Nico, uh, Dr. Stephanie Lebois, uh, research director at CNRS. Uh, and uh, the fourth panelist uh, is a bit uh, late, so he, he will join uh, later. Um, so, maybe a, a, a short reminder uh, on the rules. Uh, the panel duration is uh, supposed to be 45 minutes. We start with the perspective on a specific topic where uh, each of you will have uh, five minutes to give uh, your, your point of view. Uh, then I will uh, ask one or two uh, specific uh, questions for 10 minutes and we will finish by uh, 10 minutes of uh, public uh, So let's start. Uh, we are talking of uh, microfluidics since uh, several years now as the next big uh, thing uh, in uh, life science, life science uh, development and potential acceleration. So is today microfluidics really uh, the expected uh, revolution? Uh, so maybe Stephanie, you can, you can start. <laughs> and I need a question before I explain the definition of revolution. And the revolution is that you move around the center part and then you go back exactly at the same stage. So I <laughs> said that it's actually the revolution of my city. I think it was more confusing and not going back with it in the same place. So, how to I think it's a quite complex uh, question for me. I, I, honestly, I do not like too much the, the revolution uh, argument because I think it's like more advertising. I think what we, we were seeing at the beginning that everything will be lab and cheap and then you just put your blood, of, your drop of blood in the system and then you have all the marker you were expecting and so We are not at the, in this situation, but I think the situation we are now in is even more interesting because I think that microfluidics has really been diffusing in different areas of microfluidics, not only the question of diabetes, we discuss, for instance, with the serums and so on. So we see that, for instance, the question of the, the organ and sheep we are not really expecting from the beginning. At the same time, the, the microfluidics have also completely changed the way also biomarkers to be detected. 
And also, it is used in many different aspects in biology today, in life sciences, even like uh, Mr. Jordan, without knowing that you do microfluidics. And for me, this is maybe the most beautiful secret from the Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I probably did it as well uh, uh, because microfluidics, if you don't see microfluidics, then it's a success because we, we made this to a commercial. Uh, commercial device. I've been in microfluidics since roughly 25 years in a while. And uh, these two decades ago, everybody said, okay, if the application does not deliver at least a million parts per year, don't talk about this. And it's completely different from what we see. We are much more diverse and um, this a little bit of standardization and fabrication and design, we can set it down much different fields and not do the next glucose test with which you cannot even compete uh, price-wise. Um, and the other thing, what was promised beginning of 2000, that we have $23 billion mid of 2005. So that's uh, the nicest thing I always told. We're not yet there, but um, it improves. Uh, and we are a company with 110 people. So I can live on this. We're profitable from the beginning. So not a bad point to buy with me and microfluidics. Um, but we are in different fields than expected at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> that was the last one. And that's and the last one. <laughs> it's quite good to take that I agree with that's what right. you say. And, and yes, the lab on a chip is not here there. We are more the machine in the lab on a chip. Yeah, it could come. But for the moment, the thing is that if I think back on where I started my career, it was 2003, I saw a talk from David and dropped a page my career in our lab. Uh, so I was postdoc, young postdoc in Andrew's lab. And uh, it was quite fun because he was showing us lots of things he was doing with droplets. So I'm among the droplets is not great. So he was showing us everything you could do on droplets. And we were thinking, oh, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And of course, we're not yet there. I, I am but, told that you, you need to speak uh, louder. Uh, okay. Yes, okay. Is, uh, okay. I can do it. <laughs> I, I was doing that to speak too loud because my voice can be terrible, but okay. So anyway, so yes, we're not, yet, we're not there yet. However, uh, if I think on my field, which is oncology and cross-sectional research, and what we, what microfluidics bring us, which is, we can say revolution, but not, not in this <laughs> way. <laughs> but yes, of course, when I started working on oncology, there was simply so much in my field to do. And thanks to microfluidics, not only droplet with microfluidics, but microfluidics, we, we can't be there yet. We, we now are doing patient follow-up in a way we never want to work, something we could do. It has led us not only sensitivity, but accuracy and reproducibility. In a way we're not expecting now, we, everyone is more or less doing digital PCR to follow circulating markers. And it's not only this, in fundamental research is also allowed by allowing single cell analysis, single molecule analysis to do things we're not expecting and to understand things we're not thinking so yes, for me, we, we are, it already is a revolution, but we're not there yet. There are many, many other things, and yes, the organ energy uh, technology and the field is just amazing, and it's going so fast and doing so so much things we were not expecting. So yes, I think we. It's not the expected revolution, but it is. The revolution is more driven from the application than the, the, the basic engineering. I agree. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, maybe on, a bit on the same uh, topic, so uh, on the contrary, what, what are uh, the main barriers that you that still limit the microfluidic usage? Uh, for researchers uh, first, but also uh, as well for uh, industry also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think in the diagnostic world, it's more and more getting mainstream. So that means 20 years ago, we had to argue that it makes sense to re-neutralize. Um, and I would say since 10 years, nearly any diagnostic company has a microfluidics program. So. That is on, on diagnostic level. Also in analytics, where the numbers of devices are much smaller than in diagnostic, you see a, a constant trend. I think we are in bioanalytics, diagnostic, we are, we are there. But now the fancy applications like next gen sequencing, uh, everything was droplet, what was not foreseen, right? who was talking about droplets when microfluidics started? All these fancy things, they, they come and what's quite nice in this, this area, there are a lot of small and medium-sized companies around. 
that's not the huge microfluidics company. And that makes it interesting to, to bring the parts on the market also for, for smaller niche applications. So maybe one thing we could include is also training because of course to transfer this technology in other area that just people who are used to deal with microfluids. Of course, there is like a energy barrier that you have to cross. So there is for me some training. For, of course, your system should have some features that are very specific and interesting. But at the same time, the question for me of training people, for instance, the experience that we have in the lab is that what we developed in our team when it has to be transferred in the life science lab, it's like a crash test. Because you see if your system can, can be used by someone else who is not trained for microphysics, and then sometimes it takes a while to really understand what they know, what they understand, how they could handle the system. So for me, the question of training for this transfer is also very important. And also, taking into account from the beginning what would be the end user application is very important in the way we design the system. Yeah. Of course, in the way we work in our lab, we can invent uh, many trends and things like that. But at the end, if it's too complex or just for very highly trained people, it doesn't make yeah. sense. So, of course, taking from the beginning into account this is probably really important to extend the, to, to diffuse the technology in different uh, fields. Yeah, maybe one point also standardization that's, that's important. I mentioned earlier small and medium sized companies. Uh, and the other thing, a lot of microfluidics and is happening in particular in the organ on chip field on on everything what was set by in the uh, life science world, the 96 world play, the, the microscopy slide. So that means if you stick with this, uh, we can change one component from one supplier with, with the other and uh, also bring the reagents on board. So collaboration, I think. So you believe there is a real need of uh, standardization to uh, move forward? Yes. Uh, and, I, and I think the, the organ on chip field does it better than the microfluidics field because the microfluidics came from the electronics and then the electronics <laughs> guys were wondering why the pipette guys do not accept that standard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's completely true. Cool. The training is also very important. The training and the pedagogy we have to explain really and to understand uh, the end user needs. This is yeah. really something that is really important. Thank you, everything. And for standardization, I, I feel that that's it's something important, but for me, that's what is difficult with standardization is that you have to take into account the needs, the complexity of the needs of someone and how to make the system. I do not think that we need to have all the same chips. I think we need to have some way to control them, to, to validate them, but at the same time, I think what is for me very beautiful with my is that you have different ways to play with that. You can play with different materials, with the different forces. And it has started with the electric field, and now we move to different other fields that you can use. And so we need to keep this diversity because it is also the way microfluidic has been used in different domains of, especially of life science, but not only of life science. So there is a balance to find between the question yeah. of standard and keeping the, the, the creativity, the diversity of the field. That's I, not super easy. I totally agree for development, but then sometimes you have to adapt to work. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then. But yes. I am in the lab, you are yeah. in the <laughs> <laughs> But I also think that standards does not keep you from individual design. So that means uh, if, you, if you keep uh, some outer dimension fixed, fixed areas, yeah. it makes fabrication easier. And she got okay. okay, thank you. Um, so I have now a, a more challenging uh, question. Where uh, we are, I think, all very uh, interested by uh, by your uh, your answer. Um, what contribution uh, do you expect from uh, microfluidic in helping uh, solve some of our most uh, present uh, challenges? Uh, such as uh, global warming or uh, elsewhere. I have a first answer up to you that her husband <laughs> went to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> to be aware of microfluidics to save the world. Okay, now so I have to we save the world. <laughs> okay, so uh, the job parliament will foster microfluidics. That's the yes, thing. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, okay, do you want to start? No, I should start. Uh, so I think that on the question of energy, 
uh, what is very exciting to me that I think now with microfluidics, but also with nanofluidics, there are completely new ways to consider the prediction of energy or the way to remove salt from water and so on. For instance, we have our dear collection by Frontier Lideric Bokeh who is a great physician, physicist, and who really now has a new concept really based on nanofluidics that could really change the way we produce energy. So I think on this aspect, there are a lot to come and we are really at the beginning of the story. Yes, I really think so. And uh, I think that now the community, the, the microfluidics community is really getting into this case with new ideas, new technology, and new concepts, so I think, let's see. But I think that in a, in a few years, we will be able to provide really interesting technology. I'm also fully convinced that technology is not the only solution, mm -hmm. to be more of a question. Okay, maybe you can answer on this aspect and then we move to where okay? Well, yeah, you know, I agree with you. There's many, many things to come on this uh, technology development for, for energy. It's not completely much free, so I don't want to go too much in this. Um, I'm much more interested in the ASCAP part. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm much more, you know, let's say, specialized in this. So I'm, yeah, I would not go too much in this. But uh, yes, I we keep seeing very interesting things. For the moment, it's mainly at the stage of proof of principle for me. And it has to, but there are companies as well. Huh? There is companies, but let's see. Still quite early, but I, I truly believe there is a yeah. there is room and there is huge possibility. Yeah, I think in the healthcare and life science, uh, microfluidics is much more aware. And uh, what we see and where we are active to to go from this mainstream to look in new application like permanent monitoring, environmental screening. And what you said, production. So when I started with microfluidics, we had this, okay, for the diagnostic, it was still a little bit far away and microreaction technology make use of microfluidics for distributed production, fine chemicals. That would be something where we are looking off low chemistry. However, you, you, you phrase yeah. this interesting in particular when we have now the, um, the RNA vaccines to produce them. Um, yeah. Now, I think in terms of concept, I, I think we are more mature on the healthcare uh, and, and, yes, and toxicology, and which is related to environment. Yes, there's much more things, but I agree with you, there is things to come. Yes, we are more at the early stage, but this is also the, the flourishing period when we see completely new ideas, new concepts, as we were maybe 10 years ago in the yeah. biological yeah. site. So I'm quite to see on this aspect and on the healthcare. Well, what's mm -hmm. with that? And the technology is not technology. So originally, I mean, so 20 years ago, we could could screen, we could do this, we could look at the single cell level for, you know, a toxic compound, analyzing toxic compound drugs, and we could go for, um, let's say, 3D cultures, you know, like we were trained to have a rational use of animals, and we're doing all these things, and we are always there now. Yeah, yeah there is, I think, dermatology and all that field. But there is really some news of microfluidics which are really tremendous and which are really great. Um, so yeah, I think on the toxicology part, for sure, there is already great things and there is even much better things to come because all these tools are improving in terms of complexity, in terms of looking more like real life things. <laughs> it was originally was good, but, but anyway, anyway, so this is really important and we have to go there. Um, so yes, as toxicology, I really do think we are coming there. Yeah. And maybe you will discuss in the next uh, panel on organ and chip. And again, I think we are really at this stage where what we design to now enter the peaks. And again, I think it will be something that will be strong and super exciting. Uh, just like an example, we have been contacted for different uh, French uh, calls for clinical stuff called IHU. And we really understand now that there are really clinicians that consider that organ and chip and microfluid could be the next step for them. I know this will be Yes, yes. And, and you know, even if you say like a patient avatar and so on, it's like, okay, like the level chip 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. But, but this one, I believe it will be It's really yeah. coming there. Yes. We, we reach a level of complexity mm -hmm. that you, you could do experiments you were not expecting to do. Yes. There are things you can't do in the mind anyway. And you could really have like two more achieve like yeah. organ and achieve with really, yeah, really with, with real patients. Sometimes you can mimic many things. 
anticipation of our value. But are we still at the lab level, or, or we are now very close to the patient? Oh yeah, no, we are yes. Yes. and there is already uh, some. Uh, if you speak of ESU, there is some which are now finished, yes. and where there is a very nice uh, product at the end, uh, it's not completely as amazing as they were selling at the beginning, but still it's so new. Yeah. Look, yeah, I can tell you, actually, we are on the patient cells yeah. inside the chip. Well, no, they really use patient cells. Yes, we, we get the, 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 the piece of surgery, we saw the different cell type, and then we put them in a controlled way in this tumor and chip system. And now we are able to address clinical question, and we are discussing the clinician to really do clinical trial for which one arm will be just a micro So imagine so it's really not as imagine Yes, this is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And the first um, drugs are on the market, which were supported by uh, organ and chip models. And yeah, I think the US will do a great job with pumping billions of uh, of dollar uh, in this um, yeah this field that shows that yeah it, it goes ahead. I'm lucky not here. Yeah. But you know, we say in French, we have an expression. We say we do not have money, but we have ideas. <laughs> I think it will be both. Yes. Okay, um, okay, we should start with ideas. Okay, we should start with that at least. Yeah, at least. Okay. Yeah. But we need millions too. But anyway, yes. it's uh, <laughs> very uh, rich people in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> we are like this. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we have now some time for the, the questions. So I, I have a uh, question for um, from our uh, online audience the first one is uh, isn't the microfluidics the petri dish of tomorrow that we can buy anywhere who wants to i would say yes and no um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the petri dish will be partly uh, uh partly but when, when you compare to petri dish in, in cell culture and organ chip, I think they, are, they will be complemented by uh, by this organ and chip field. Um, if the um, if the uh, question is targeted in the way, okay, um, is it more or less okay? The, the former in Germany, you would say the Eppendorf catalog with all these Eppendorf cuts, uh, microfluidic okay, petri dishes will be replaced by microfluidics. I would say. Partly, we have a microfluidics catalog, and we see it increasing, and um, but it will not replace. And, uh, and, and I think it's going to be complementary. Yes. Uh, yeah. When you like to occupy your sense, you don't want to do it on the one scale experiment. But it will, so it will have its place mm -hmm. in the world. Yes. So it's not. No, yeah. but again, it goes also with the question of validation because at some point to replace standards, you should show what is the added value of your system. So again, we need also to get more validation of our system. So it won't replace, but for sure, it will add new value to the system. Sure. Yeah, and to this, you mentioned the training at the beginning, yeah. and we need to bring fluids in, not only pipetting something on top. So that means training uh, together with complete solution. Um, will make it that it's it's complementary to what is existing in the lab. Okay. Uh, the second question I have uh, it's probably uh, for you, uh, for you. Uh, Today, many companies uh, sell microchips. Can end user find their happiness without uh, needing a physicist? Um, avoid the physicist. That is easier. Um, so I'm married to one. Um, <laughs> so. And then when you construct the system or make the ones happen, okay, but in left you need this training. And I would say it's easy because you have to just look at the flow. So write down what you would like to do, and then it's easy to do things. So that would be my explanation to my Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we still have some time for uh, the audience question. <laughs> I think there is no more question, except that uh, Anthony agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe some question in the, in the room. Who wants to start?
Max? So you mentioned that there was a big uh, progress on the uh, XTR and on different motor uh, application power chips. Uh, what about cosmetics? Uh, we mentioned a lot, you know, uh, animal testing and placement. Uh, was there any evidence this last year about that? Well, I'm not from this field, but from what I read and from what I read, yes, for sure. It's now there's many, many uh, at least research and uh, progress that has been done. They can't use at least where it's they can't use animals anymore. They can't use animals. Uh, in, in, in medicine, in healthcare, you still have to use animals and just make a rational use of it. But in, in cosmetics, they have to replace it. And a lot of the tools they have developed have been based on microcritics. But we really have very expensive system now that has been done on it. But mostly they need to work with tools. And I yeah. think that there are a lot of industrial yeah. models that are. That some are microscopic, some, some are, are bigger microscopic, some not. Oh, so they could use microscopic or not. I think for all the question of foundation, <laughs> it could be of interest to work with microscopic yeah. because you could have a, a control and a support that you are not able to reach with conventional methods. So I would say that not yeah. only on the in vitro models but also yeah. on the foundation yeah. side, I think there is clearly an advantage. And there is a huge interest from this company. Yeah. Because you mentioned financing was a bit for this production. But in France, we have a very important and nice luxe uh, group, and industrials, which should, um, let's say, they should help. I mean, the, the French research in this sense. <laughs> What's your opinion about that? I think they, they yeah. have some interest for that. I don't know to which extent they invest, but in the luxe yeah. uh, company, there are some of them who are looking for new industrial models and so on. So I think they are really interesting. Uh, there was a huge program at one point when they were sustaining research uh, it, it's in many different ways. Um, then, in specific area of, of course, really the, the use and the cosmetic and the, for this, I'm not completely. Uh, in the field that I'm not really looking for this at the moment. But anyhow, I, I discuss with many people who, who are really interested and say they have programs on this. And where it is, I'm mm. not completely sure. I know that they're very good interest. You could try to get money, I understand. <laughs> at least some development could benefit towards the towards a, towards a, safety. Another question? Yeah. What what does the panel think will be the biggest growth area in the future for microfluidics? <laughs> we always look to Julia when we um, speak. <laughs> um, yeah, growth area in young diagnostic is by far um, the, the area with the highest number of parts and probably with the highest volume. Um, but Besides inkjet printer and what what is discussed there, uh, but is it the most interesting one uh, because the uh, the margins are rather low or, um, and you are really pressed for the penny and have from complexity the organ on chip from from chip complexity is so much less complex than um, what you what you have in diagnostics so. Um, Yes, that will be the largest field at the moment, um, but is it the interesting one? So uh, I think droplet generation is one huge, huge field with rather simple devices um, and the intelligent in the application. Then you have to decide. So th therefore, we look as a small company, we are interested also in these niche applications um, where the margin is much higher. And I would say that the question of energy works. It could be a major market as well. I think it will work, but it will change the material aspect completely. Yeah. So now we for the, the diagnostic, we are completely in this plastic field, and then we turn into glass, metal, yeah. and yeah. we are working on to make this transformation technology wise. So we have still room for one last question. Maybe it's more a comment than a question. It, it relates to, to what you said about the, the question of uh, what changed so much from the beginning of microfluidic. And as an old timer, I can <laughs> have a view on that. At the very beginning of microfluidics, we had this idea of the 
love of cheap and being something like point of care and so on. And we realized that uh, uh, finally what is most amazing about the development of microquid is not at all uh, in this area for the moment. It's, it's like it's next generation sequencing and things that we had no idea it would come at the very beginning. And I think one uh, big question is, so finally, the feeling is that the, cost, the final cost is really a very critical point, and indeed you can mention that too, is that in the point of care and diagnosis, uh, the, the, yeah. the problem of cost is absolutely critical because this, uh, this bond, uh, the diagnosis are extremely cheap, and that if you want to make it, uh, if you want to make money with that, you have a huge uh, market. Whereas if you do something uh, completely uh, out of the blue with the idea of blue ocean that is uh, uh, pleasant to uh, financiers, and then of course it's, it's much easier in terms of uh, economic uh, access. Yeah, maybe, so, maybe one comment to do you, John. And um, it's so when, when I see how much plastic we produce with all these diagnostic consumable, I feel really ashamed, in particular when we have the situation here uh, not only cost, but um, produ production of garbage, but on the other hand, it's for the health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's some good way. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all very much to uh Does it work? So okay, here and um, it works too. Okay, okay, so sorry for this uh, interruption. Uh We'll try to, to save your precious time. So um, yeah, I'll continue the presentation. So uh, um, we have uh, here Dr. Jose Luis Garcia Cordero, who is a principal scientist and the lead of uh, uh, microtechnology at, uh, at Roche. Um, then um, Dr. Nathalie Maubon, who is founder, CEO, CSO of HES Pharma a startup. So we had, of course, um, representative. It's a bit opposite to the previous panel because we have a majority of uh, people from the industry, but also uh, eminent uh, scientists from the academic world, uh, Professor Martin Knight from Queen Mary University and a professor of uh, mechanobiology. And also, I think, head of uh, Emulate uh, Queen Mary uh, um, Technology Center or something like that. So, um, so I'll first, um, yes, as I mentioned, the, 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 this, or the, um, the topic of this uh, panel is uh, uh, specifically uh, organ on chips, which was, uh, were already hinted at in the previous one. And I will ask you to, to, to kindly uh, uh, present in about a few min uh, five minutes each uh, your vision uh, about the, the state of uh, organ on chip uh, industrial uh, adoption. So I don't know who, uh, yeah, in the question, in the original uh, panel question, it was myth or reality. Uh, for us uh, researchers, of course, it's something in which we, we put a lot of belief, but uh, also understand that there are strong barriers before something can become uh, industrial. So um, what would be your opinion about that? Uh, maybe, uh, um, I don't know, do maybe Dr. Uh, sorry, Kibler, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, no, the question is for people online. Maybe you can try, and if doesn't, or if, as you like, or if you come here, I can. Yeah. Okay. Or, okay, so yeah, uh, um, so I will give some maybe insights about our, um, about the industrial point of view, let's say. So uh, we have 
worked with um, micro microchips since uh, maybe 10 to 12 years now for this project. Okay, so I think it's probably better you compute. <laughs> Sorry for. <laughs> Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have tried to, to work on it since, uh, I would say, now a decade. Um, we are, so the question was, is it the dream or reality? I think it's a dream coming true, So, but we are not there for sure. Uh, there is a lot to do. The, the question has already been addressed a little bit by the, by the previous panelists. There is a lot to do with regard to standardization, validation, and so on. And this needs, uh, this is high resource demanding, I, I would say. So in my field, in the DMPK, we have, uh, there is a, a huge offer, I would say, for, uh, for the moment in, uh, on the market. There are a lot of chips. Uh, you just have to choose the, the right one. Uh, this is uh, something which is uh, not easy uh, always. What we have faced in the past, uh, which is still uh, an issue for me in some for some companies, is that uh, it is the material um, which which uh, these chips are made. So there is still some material that is using PDMS, and for us in the MBK, it is just not possible because uh, when dealing with small molecules, depending on where they are highly lipophilic, they will stick on your on your device, and uh, this is a, a big hurdle, I would say. So more and more companies are taking this into account, but still there are companies dealing with PDMS, and this is something that, uh, in my opinion, we are not able to overcome. So uh, this is for the for the liver. We uh, we try to work also on um, blood-brain barrier models because uh, the the classical uh, in vitro settings, which is trans well, is not uh, not fully satisfactory. So uh, it's a big challenge as well because uh, um, maybe the device could be okay, but what is really important? It is true for the liver. I, I think uh, whatever the the organ you are addressing is um, the cells. And the cell sourcing, I think this is very, uh, this is very important uh, because even if your device is reproducible and uh, standardized and or miniaturized, depending on where you are, you are in the value chain, whether you are more in discovery, so we are more in discovery, but in the past we are, we are more, in, I was more in development as the quality of your cells is very important uh, if you want to have reproducible results. So it is true for classical models, I would say, but it is even more true. Uh, I don't know if it is shared by others, but uh, it is even more true for uh, microphysic, uh, microphysiological systems or organoids or, or things like that. And uh, yeah, so I'm very optimistic. And uh, in our company, uh, we are really, there is a real interest to go into, into these uh, devices or in these models. Uh, but sometimes what I have to say is that we are facing some skepticism as well from the scientific uh, communi community uh, internally, also from the management sometimes, because we are small, uh, small teams. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the question is asked whether it is, uh, what will be the return of investment, because it is pretty um, uh, labor intensive, because we want to, to test the, the models in-house. In uh, you, you, it requests uh, highly skilled people as well. And uh, uh, yes, sometimes the question is, yes, but at the end of the day, we will still need to go into the animals to, uh, to, to, to make the proof of the concept. And uh, uh, sometimes this is difficult to, to overcome this, uh, this, uh, this argument, in fact. But I think there is room to, to put this kind of system between, between the animals and more, uh, more simpler, uh, um, uh, models, which is 2D, classical 2D, or just receptor binding, for instance, uh, models. So, but uh, yes, this is still something that we need to do. Okay, so <laughs> I leave the floor. <laughs> no, no, it's not too much. <laughs> no, I think. Okay, yeah, maybe we'll come back. So, uh, yes, maybe. Um, Hello. Yeah, works. Okay. So maybe you, 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 have the, you have at first this double vision from the technologists and the pharmacologists, which may be yeah. you a specific insight. Yeah, I also have the triple vision from academia as well. Uh, because before joining Grosh, I was uh, running my own lab. I, I was supervising PhD students and 
uh, undergrads. And then a year ago, I did this transition to um, pharma, uh, where I'm leading the microtechnologies group. And dream of reality, um, Rush invested last year a lot of money into funding this uh, Rush Institute for Translational Bioengineering, which is um, trying to develop new human model systems that eventually might replace uh, animal model systems and accelerate the discovery of new drugs. And the mission of our institute is to develop these new technologies. Um, so part of my, what my group is doing is to develop new microfluidic technologies to uh, culture, organoids. Um, um, and the reason we're doing this is because there's not a single company out there that is bringing this solution. Um, there's a lot of startups, companies, and I won't name, uh, give names, uh, but they are developing these devices made of PDMS, made of different materials that are not compatible with cells or they are difficult to use. Um, so one of the missions of my group is to bring these technologies in-house um, and together with the scientists, biologists in, in Rush, um, perfect these technologies. So I think it's, uh, as, as the previous panel said, there's a lot of um, micro, microfluidics has been around for 20 years, but there's not really a solution. There's a lot of companies out there, but even in, in the pharma, we, there's a lot of companies that present their products, but none of them fills all our needs. Um, and we're hoping that by having doing our own research internally, we can provide the solutions internally. So this is a new um, concept also in, in, in industry, I think. Um, the idea behind this also goes back years, years back um, on, on the, the vision that a tele telecommunication company had. Um, the name is Bell Labs, you know, Bell Labs came up with a lot of uh, inventions, not only uh, silicon chips, but optical fibers, telecommunications, satellite communications. And the idea of our institute is to bring new, change the, the way science is done. Um, I'm, I'm gonna refer back to what they were saying in the previous panel in academia. We tend to devise, or come up with new technologies, very complex, you know, a lot of valves, pumps, a lot of sensors that at the end of the day are not, we cannot use it in a, in a company. It's, you know, sometimes we need like very simple technologies. Um, and you see that an example of that is with the sequence technologies. If you look at the device, it's just a T, you know, just to produce droplets and that's it. And that's how they produce. Uh, the, the, the rest comes from the reagents, but mostly the technology, the microfluidics is very simple. Um, and a lot of the, the, what I'm seeing now is that we actually need, uh, the scientists in, in pharma just need very simple solutions. And it seems like there is a disconnect from what people are doing in academia or some companies are trying to sell us. It's, it's very different from the needs that we have. Um, and I don't know what's the solution if pharma has been talking to academia for a long time, but it seems like there's not this connection um, yeah, so that's my, my take. I hope I didn't confuse you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Following this question, maybe we can switch directly to, uh, uh, yes, so, so. Uh, well, as an academic, um, I'm probably not particularly qualified to talk about industry limitations, um, but I'm used to lecturing to a larger group, so at least I can shout to the back anyway. Um, so I think perhaps we should start with some, some good news. I think the, the organ ship systems for 
safety and toxicity testing are already there, already validated um, and are available. So the, the liver toxicity chips, for example. So I think there's, there's a lot of um, promise there that that's going to be used uh, by industry. However, if we look at the, the chips that are required for efficacy testing, how do we create models of all the range of different diseases that we need to? Um, how do we build in that complexity? And that I think is a, is a real challenge, how we, we, we do that. I think it needs uh, versatile platform technology that's gotta be really simple to use. But what we don't know is the level of complexity we need to build into those models. So I'm a professor of mechanobiology, so I would argue that our, our models need to incorporate the appropriate physiological, pathological, mechanical stimulation that the, the organs, the tissues perceive in vivo. But there's all sorts of other complexity that we should build in, or, or maybe we don't need to. And that's the question. It probably is going to be context dependent, but how do we develop these efficacy models that are accurately predictive of performance of a, a given drug in, in human in vivo. So I think that's, that's a real challenge for us. One of the difficulties as I see it is that model development falls between academia and industry. And in academia, it can be quite difficult to get funding for model development. It's not seen as the, the really exciting hypothesis driven, sexy research. Um, and yet in industry, maybe they don't have the time or the capacity to be able to develop all of the, the range of different models that are needed. So I think working out how to fund model development is something that, that we're gonna need to do. Um, building on the, the, the platform technology that maybe is available there and making those models so they're, they're context dependent and they have the sufficient complexity to replicate in vivo, but they're not over-engineered. So I think that's, that's important. And of course, that then leads on to, to validation, how we validate our models. It's very, or it's much easier to validate a, a toxicity model because it's well known um, what should produce a, a toxic response. It's much harder and, and very context dependent to validate a, an efficacy model. So I think that's, that is a challenge. Um, but again, we need to put the investment into to developing and validating these organ chip models. Another area that I think is, is a challenge for us is cost. Um, when we talk to the technology companies that supply these fantastic organ chip platforms, we're often told that a, an organ chip equates to a, an animal in terms of cost. But at the other end, we, we have our you know, micro, well, uh, micro um, well plates, we have our Petri dishes. These are incredibly cheap systems to build models on. So we need, if we're going to roll out this technology, I think we need to look at um, how we can reduce the cost so that it becomes more, more available for routine use, um, not just for replacing animal work. Um, and I agree with uh, what's been said previously that at the moment, in the foreseeable future, it will reduce animal work, the organ chip technology, but I think it's, it's unlikely to completely replace in the, the drug development pipeline. And, and lastly, I think from an academic point of view, we see um, one of the biggest challenges is training uh, for graduates so that they have that, that multidisciplinary skill. They understand the industry environment and they understand the, the regulatory framework that uh, organ ship technology has to exist within. So being able to provide our, our PhD graduates with that, that multidisciplinary multi-sector experience, I think is, is the next big challenge. We need a whole generation of bioengineers, bioscientists who are able to develop and push forward this technology. And that needs specialist training done in partnership with all the stakeholders, industry, regulatory authorities as well. So that's, that's from me. Okay, thank you. So maybe you can keep, uh, uh, yes, oh, sorry. Ah, uh, you have microphone now. Okay, okay, so if you can, uh, it works. It works. Okay. So for my part, uh, I have worked more than 10 years in pharmaceutical industries. I have to manage in vitro models uh, in ADME and after that uh, in efficacy. And I've created HS Pharma seven years ago with the goal to improve the drug discovery process. And for that, my feeling is one 
is firstly to, to, to change 2D to 3D cellular models, and then to go to, to, to from static to dynamic conditions. It's because of that I have uh, founded HS Pharma with this, book, with this goal to improve the drug score process. The issue is that for that we need the, the right 3D cellular models. So we, in HS Pharma, we have internalized internalize a new and rescue technology uh, 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 to really recreate the XSR that is highly uh, porous, porous in order to have the, the thread, the thread uh, going between the cells in this, in this matrix. So that we want to go now, we have our 3D cellular models. We want to go after that to dynamics, uh, dynamic with organon chip systems. The issue that we have is that uh, for now, no uh, organon chip systems is usable for our technology. I think that for now, we have a lot of 2D cell culture in, in, in dynamic conditions. To go further, we need to go to 3D, to 3D uh, cell systems. And for that, we have a lot of hydrogel-based systems used in organon chip systems. But the, the issue is that hydrogel is nanoporous. So it's, it's really difficult to use organon chip systems with uh, hydrogel-based systems. It's because of that, we want to combine organon chips with bioluminous technology, allowing us to really recreate the right SSR matrix for any type of organs. And for that, we work with uh, academic researchers to, to, to design the right uh, organon chip systems. So we work with Anthony Fézébré, with uh, Vincent Sonnet from Lille, or Cécile Le Gallet from, uh, from uh, UTC. So we know that we need to, to find the right design, the right, uh, uh, the right uh, parallelized systems. Since in, uh, in pharmaceutical industries, we don't need to, we, we have not to, to work on one or two chips, but so we need to have several conditions, several con concentrations, several drugs that we want to test. Well, I know that, that a lot of pharmaceutical industries use mimet mimeta systems. It's not really organon chips. But it starts to have parallelization of uh, fluidic systems. I think we, we, we are going the right way, but we need to do that in, in uh, using the right combination of technology. So the right combination of 3D cell culture system, the right combination of uh, parallelized systems, the right design, and uh, as uh, Sylvie told us previously, the right, the right plastic systems since PDMS, we know that in ADME and efficacy assays or safety assays, we need to have the drug that go directly to the cells, and we have a lot of drugs that stick to the plastic. So we need also to, to, to have also the, 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 the right design and the right uh, systems for organic systems. So I think that's for now, we 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 the right direction, but we need to think really for all these parts in order to really have the right the right system, and especially also to miniaturize these systems. I, I have two from uh, two questions which are connected together and uh, raise this question of the future. So one question is: Can organ on chip become a medical device tomorrow? With a question of regulation. And the other question is a bit more precise. On the 20th of September, the FDA Modernization Act gives drug sponsors the option to use scientifically rigorous proven non-animal test method when they are suitable. So the question is, is it a clear indication that in vitro model will become the norm and replace animals? So it comes with things which have been discussed. And I would add personally, in vitro model doesn't necessarily mean organ on chip. So what is the position of the organ on chip for, from your point of view, and especially uh, uh, in, in the industry with this, uh, with this FDA uh, uh, evolution of the regulation? What, what is for you the position of organ on chips in this? Uh, so who, who would like to, to answer? <laughs> I can, have, can give some, some idea yeah. on that. I think that drug screening initiative. Firstly, we need to, to test a library of a lot of uh, several compounds or, or biologicals here. And for that, we need a static condition in straight for well plate. It will be difficult to really test that at first screenings, but for secondary screenings, we need to implement organon. And that one to do uh, 
in the uh, in the US is to 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 recreate human on chip in order to test the drugs on the on the systems that we can see if we we have the efficacy on the right the right uh, organs and if we have also the safety for all organs and for that I think that uh, the organ on chips and human on chip will arrive at uh, secondary screening in the drug screening systems. Um, well, I'm not a biologist, but what I've heard is that it's going to be difficult to replace um, animal testing in the near future just because of the complexity of biology. Uh, like all of these organs interconnected. Like, yeah, you might develop a drug that goes to the brain, but you don't know the secondary effects that are going to have in the rest of the organs. And yeah, people are working on this uh, human body on a chip. When is it going to be ready? Yeah. It's huge speculation. Uh, okay, so yeah. I think so, it's maybe, I think it's going to be a combination of having both models at the same time. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I would agree, in fact, um, the fact that there, there is this initiative at the FDA where they are testing some some systems in their labs and so on. This is a good, I think, a message for us to, to go into this. Now, uh, there is yes, this, this commitment that sponsor can su submit a uh, um, dossier with just um, non-animal studies. So from our point of view, I, I think we are not there. Uh, <laughs> maybe only for some niches, I think, maybe uh, if some, I don't know, uh, for, for safety, I, I don't, I, I know that for, it's not my domain, but uh, for some, for some aspects that, that are, they are already already using only in vitro, uh, in, in vitro models, but uh, I, I agree with Jose, we, we, we still rely on, on animals at the end, I, I guess, so uh, for the, for the submission and for the dossier. And I think so. there may be some niche areas in which animal models fail, so yeah. that... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think so. For some, uh, maybe so for um, some monoclonal antibodies where the, the target is not expressed in in, in any animals and and so on, where, where the mechanism of action is known or things like that, maybe this could be. Um, I, I think maybe it has already been done. Uh, I, I think this could be a, a, an option, but for small molecules, I don't think that we will get rid of of animals uh, in the in the coming years. I think. Can I just, just, just come in on, on that one? one. Um, there's, there's already, as I said at the beginning, uh, some of the, the toxicity <laughs> testing is already there. Um, there's a very nice paper from my colleague at Emulate, Lorna Ewart, who's um, done a, a very large chip study looking at the, the liver toxicity um, and showing that it's actually better at predicting efficacy in, in vivo. Um, with an increasing number of donors um, compared to the, the existing animal tests. And the cost saving from that, um, I think, would, is going to amplify or increase the, the rollout of this sort of technology. So I think for toxicity testing, we're really rapidly going to see that, that taken on. I think, as I said at the beginning, the efficacy testing, um, the, the issues about whether you try and join up multiple organs, whole body systems, um, that is, is going to be much harder, um, and I think it will be valuable as part of the, the drug discovery, drug development pipeline, but it's not going to replace animal anytime soon. Okay, I have another question which is a bit uh, provocative. <laughs> um, I've seen this huge gap between where people, uh, between, I try to translate to make it, uh, between um, uh, Innovations made in uh, in the microfluidic industries, mostly startup and pharma, which aren't really concerned about the new innovations and rather focused on product development. Um, so, my understanding of, of that is is that indeed uh, there has been an evolution in uh, uh, in industry in general, in which uh, you mentioned Bell Labs, and of course that. That's an evolution from this uh, uh, kind of gold age in which there was a huge innovation and creativity in big companies, and there has been uh, a shift from that in which big companies more 
uh, make innovation by acquisition than in house. Mm -hmm. uh, but I understand from what you say that uh, in Roche, at least, there is some motion out of this model back to more uh, innovation inside yeah. uh, exploratory. The exploratory. So, yes. um, yeah, I think that's something on which uh, vary opinions from the different areas of industry, both startups and Mm. And, and Roche and maybe Sanofi also, because Roche has this special uh, uh, situation in which there is both uh, uh, technology and pharmacy. So maybe you can say a word on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, even for Roche, I think it is a new model um, to invest um, in the technology side, in the engineering side, because most of PREP. Uh, the, the, the arm that develops the drugs are mostly chemists, biologists. And we, of course, have the diagnostic division that is full of engineers, uh, but it's separate from the main business of developing drugs. So bringing engineers, bioinformaticians, um, we have a team that is looking at high throughput technologies, liquid handlers, uh, robotics, um, high throughput screening, bringing all of that into a company i think it's it's opening new areas of, of research collaboration internally um and you, you of course you need the commitment of the company uh, you need the investment in the long term it's not something that's gonna happen results are gonna come out in the next two or three years i think it's a, a long-term plan and companies need to do that about long-term plan, maybe I, I can add a question uh, related to several of you say, the ex except in toxicology, uh, I get the general feeling that in this, we are not there yet. So could you, would you have a feeling, in, and I understand that there is a question of uh, throughput and cost. Um, uh, what is your feeling about the level of the gap that would be uh, that will be needed for uh, this uh, technology to enter massively uh, uh, into pharmaceutical research. Research would it be a for it in terms of throughput? I was uh, uh, yes stricken by the fact that uh, organs on chip are still one organ, one experimental point model, whereas all other screening either microtype or plate or blood plate or even organoids i the way i understand it is always one experiment is a hundred of points or, or 384 or so so uh, at which at which stage do you think what is the level of, of the gap we have to just still jump to to be adopted by pharmacy mm -hmm. i i know it's a very difficult question mm -hmm. but uh, if you have some hint on that also to give people from the research what is the, the kind of uh, challenge we have to face i think that there is already some a lot of concept to use the, the, the organic chip so we know that we need to go i know that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies for pharmaceutical companies work with uh, Researchers to norm, to standardize and and parallelize the, the, these systems. Uh, for us, we, we work, for example, with fluigens in order to 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 have this organochip not only on one, but we can have twelve to twenty four conditions in parallel. I know that uh, Pfizer has worked in in the U.S. to parallelize in twenty four well, wells uh, microfluidics device. We know that we already some pharmaceutical industries go in this direction, so I think that the direct the the, the gap is not so huge. We can go there, and we need to go there since uh, I know that cosmetic industries have to uh, work only on in vitro animal models, and I know that in the US they want to to decrease uh, to. 30% 30, 30 in 2025, but they want to suppress all, all testing for all, all uh, industries, pharmaceutical industries, uh, at uh, 2030. So 2030 is tomorrow. 
in pharmaceutical industries, they want to suppress all animal testing is because of that. They put a lot of money to work in this direction, 3D in organ and chip system to go to human and plate. Yeah, and if I can comment on the reduction uh, of the use of animals, we have a, a commitment also to decrease the, the, the use of animals by 50% uh, by 2030. So, um, so, so we, as mentioned by Natalie, we need to go into this after. There is a, a question of, uh, of means that we put in. Uh, so, uh, um, for instance, we are doing a lot with collaboration, as you mentioned, with academia or, or little startups in order to test the, the models. Um, after, the, the thing I, is to try to convince and to have a proof of concept that uh, this system will be uh, better than an animal or things like that. And sometimes this is lacking, I think. But anyway, we will need to go there. And, uh, and but after, the, yes, the means sometimes are not... Uh, are not al always there, I think, and um, but again, it is a, a state of mind. I think that we maybe need to uh, to, to impulse and to uh, to communicate. I think and sharing the expertise uh, uh, internally, but also externally, like we're doing here, is very important. I think to uh, to convince people that uh, that uh, it is the future. In fact, not only for uh, for the reduction in the free air uh, context, I would say, but also scientifically uh, because it it could address question that we are not able to address with animals because an animal is not a human. And uh, in this, I think uh, the, the chips are, are the future, I guess. But uh, a lot to do, I think. But sharing the expertise and, uh, and the use cases and so on, I think it is very, uh, is very important. Okay, indeed, I had, uh, we had on, uh, online a question uh, um, which was what will force the pharmaceutical industry to use these alternative models tomorrow? But I think this question, you uh, exact this is question exactly uh, answered it. So maybe we have no other question in line. So maybe uh, it's time for uh, uh, people to, to make make the uh, effort to come and uh, to ask questions. So could you just comment on this about the comparison to other links? Ah, yes, so I will repeat the question. So, uh, can you give some comments about the difference between, or difference, or, yeah. The rest uh, and, the and uh, yes, so um, uh, relative advantages or disadvantages of uh, organoids, organon chips, and organoid on chip. <laughs> For sure, for me, the future is uh, organoin on chip. Going from 2D to 2D in dynamic condition, condition with organ on chip, we, we, are, we have no, not relevance in vitro models uh, by using just cells. We really need to, 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 to have the cells embedded in the right uh, exosomal matrix, the right environments. So I think that my feeling is really, really that we need to combine all, biotech, all breakthrough technologies starting from the 3D excess matrix, the organo chip systems, and we need, we need to use the, also the, the right cells with iPSC or primary cells, and also use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 for gene engineering. So I think that combining all these breakthrough technology that are, that are just 10 years ago, uh, we will go in the right direction. But starting from 2D, going to 2D in dynamic condition, and for, for me, it's not the right way. Yeah. Okay, I agree. Even if you are <clears throat> to um, culture organoids, um, it's known that when you need to introduce flow to remove waste, introduce more nutrients, and also you need some shear forces so that the organoids can develop better. Um, so that just simple challenge is it's, it's very difficult. Um, and I think a combination of both technologies and new technologies that are going to be emerging is, is going to be the way to go because organoids a few years ago no one knew it was not in the in the, in the map you know and now it's five years from five years is everyone is doing organoids so I think it's going to be it's going to be a combination of, of technologies because uh, my, my understanding of organ on a chip is just monolayers of two cells epithelial and Endothelial cells separated from membrane, mostly that's it's when. It's really a well, 
but yeah, I guess it's 3D because you already it's have two different. Yeah, it's not only the image and chip. I mean, yeah. if you have a chip that's really long and a chip, you have to do ourselves on the 3D or that cell from the network. So mm -hmm. it's not only uh, just two stacks of cells from the organ and chip, it could be more complex than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a combination of, yeah. at least for, for me, combining all of, all of these technologies. Any other question in the room? Yes. Um, yeah, maybe a, a question to um, Sylvie, Nathalie, on the, uh, you all mentioned PDMS and said, okay, that's not the material uh, you would like to see as a communication company. We are fighting since 20 years against the use of PDMS. What can we do? commonly to uh, get it to reasonable plastics can you force them <laughs> yeah, because the technologies are around and that's why i'm always wondering what we can do there i don't know it's difficult but we just make the, the, the we have tested pdms we know it's not suitable so after we are trying other materials because now developers are using like the, the same Poly, uh, what it is, uh, polycarbonate, things like that. But we know that it's not it's not a, a gas permeable like like PDMS. So this is a, one of the drawback. We know also that PDMS, and this is the reason one of the reasons why it is used, is a uh, is easy uh, easy need to manufacture. So this is something that we learned also. But just for us, just <laughs> not possible. In fact, because we have tried to overcome, in fact, this uh, this uh, this binding of our compounds to the to the material by doing so for instance i'm doing clearances mm -hmm. hepatic clearances so but uh, when you have a highly lipophilic compound you have your 90 percent of your compound which is stick on the pdms so sometimes people told us yeah yeah but maybe we could do some modeling and try to uh, mm -hmm. to do some equation and to subtract your from the the total metabolism the adsorption no i think it's not it's not feasible because you you still have you already have some um, some uh, how to say uh, some error in your measure, but if you if you incorporate one additional one, which is huge because for some compounds we had ninety percent of compound which was stick on the on the on the PDMS, knowing that also you have also desorption, so you have to uh, to uh, to take care of the adsorption of the compound and after the desorption of the compound. So after there are techniques that uh, people say, okay, let's uh, let's wait, try to um, to um, to block using BSA or things like that, but. I, from in my opinion, at least, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a solution. So, which one is the best one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and again, it's not uh, our intention to develop our own chips. So, at least in, in, in my lab, so we are testing chips and trying to see that they are suitable to to the use that we uh, would like. So, for safety, for for uh, ADME and so on. But yeah, which material? I don't know. <laughs> Yes. Um, I'm curious about this one for tonight, because if I understand it correctly, you work with Emulate, which is a really nice chip. What's your opinion on the So, so we, we're, we're not using it for drug testing, testing at the moment. moment. Um, I understand that Emulate are coming out with a, a new chip that is isn't PDMS, um, I think. Um, but for a lot of the testing that we're doing, we're setting up the sort of efficacy disease models for the different 3D tumors, um, muscular skeletal models. So it's not a, it, it doesn't impact on us at the moment. Um, so we can do, do everything with PDMS and then when a new material comes along, um, we can change that over and, and keep going with the, the model that we've developed. I, I think depending on what you are uh, looking for, for instance, we are looking for clearance. So this is a huge hurdle. But when you are doing, uh, when you are looking at uh, at toxicity, you are doing chronic dosing, repeated dosing. So maybe at what time we saturate? Maybe PDMS could be. Uh, and yes, the, those chips are developed for this. Uh, and so I think it, it's less problematic, I would say, than for our purpose. So, but anyway, I think we should get rid of PDMS. Uh, it was the same issues when we started vitro essays on static conditions. We started with plastic, uh, with polystyrene uh, plates. But uh, when we work in ADME, uh, we, we know that we have an issue of bi the, the binding, the drug that bind to the, to, the, to, the, to the polystyrene. It's because of that we go to, to polycarbonates. 
And I know that uh, PDMS is the same thing that plastic. Uh, but for all ADME safety uh, or efficacy essays, we need to have the drugs that go to the cells, not to stick to the, plas to the plastic. So I think that for, for, to go further, uh, for, for us, for example, we work with, uh, with, uh, we will work with a plastic uh, industries in Taiwan and we work, we, we start to, to work with uh, polycarbonates in all in vitro essays, uh, in static conditions are done in, in, in polycarbonates. Okay, we have another, we are, I think, approaching the end of the session. We have another question from Marisa, which is from online, which is uh, quite technical in my understanding. Has there been many studies or development looking at particulate and field-based uh, stimulation to mimic uh, non-invasive uh, to mimic uh, me mechanical and electropotential stimulation in organic tissue? So that's very specific in organic tissue. So probably that could be a Well, I'm not quite sure I can answer it all, but um, so we're looking at using electric fields to produce aligned 3D matrices. Um, and there's, well, so to start, we just produce the, the scaffold, but we, we're interested in all sorts of physico-chemical stimulation of the cells. So primarily it's looking at mechanical stimulation, but we have also uh, interest in looking at electrical stimulation as well. Um, within a, uh, a 3D chip model. Yeah, maybe I could have a, a kind of partial answer to that to be on the field of uh, uh, microelectrode arrays for uh, studies of neurons. Of course, this field is, is well known and uh, people make arrays of neurons and use arrays of electrodes to stimulate. So this so definitely, this is a way, but can we consider that arrays of neurons uh, are organs on chip, that uh, these are 2D systems, but uh, we, and we have been indeed working on that a lot. You can organize the now with microfluidics, the architecture of neurons to, to, to push them towards uh, uh, specific uh, connectivity and so on. So in, my own opinion would be that, uh, that that's part of the field of organ and chips, even if it's in the system. So I don't know if it's answered. I want to question. add also the yeah. mechano stimulation, is especially for oncology fields. Yeah. You know that uh, yeah, right. in oncology, the, the stiffness of the exosome matrix increase, and we have uh, mechanical stress in the cells. Mm -hmm. And the idea is we need to create chamber in microfluidic micro device. And to have the compression chamber in order to, to recreate this uh, this uh, this mechanical mechan mechan stress in the sense. Yes, you're right. Indeed, that uh, there has been a lot of mechanobiology studies in microfluidics. It was not not probably recognized as organ and sheep in uh, as such, but uh, in some sense, it, or, or at least uh, organic. Okay, maybe a last. The last urgent question, and if not, we'll, uh, we'll stop this session. And of course, thank a lot again, um, our panel speaker. Okay, I would just uh, conclude. I just want to give a few First of all, I would like to, to thank you uh, for the very uh, interesting uh, discussion and uh, input uh, you brought into these two uh, very exciting uh, fields of microfluidic and organic chip. Uh, thank you for the good interaction with the people here, with the people uh, following us uh, with Muki. Uh, and I think it's a uh, great exchange and uh, discussion. So, uh, maybe my, my takeaways uh, <laughs> from these two, two discussions. Uh, one is that uh, I guess there is still a very large potential for development in front of us, um, uh, either pushed by a new regulation or by uh, discovering and exciting a new application. So I think we still have a lot uh, to do uh, in the future, and uh, it's a very promising area to, to continue to work on. I can also note some uh, challenges uh, that you have all uh, shared, so a few, few words. 
uh, miniaturization, ease of use, automation, simplicity, uh, models, validation, technology, material, cost, uh, etc. So I think this is some organization. This is uh, the challenges that we all have to, uh, to work on and, uh, and to uh, overcome, uh, to continue uh, and to make this, uh, this good a uh, bigger uh, success. Uh, I would say, um, yeah, as we gents, uh, we really work hard uh, to continue to support uh, the activity, to accelerate the development, uh, and to be part of this revolution. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we are working hard on, on, on meeting some of these uh, barriers and, and challenges. Uh, I'll be very happy to give a few examples uh, later on for, for the people uh, who are here. With, uh, with uh, showing uh, two uh, new uh, disruptive uh, products that are going to be uh, on the market very, very soon. Uh, one is uh, answering the need for miniaturization, ease of use, automation, simplicity for organ energy, organ weight. I think, uh, in more general way. And yeah, I think we have a slide, maybe we can just uh, share it for, also for the people who are not here. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so this will be uh, a new product. We'll be happy to live demo in a few minutes, uh, which is called the uh, Omi. Uh, and uh, the second uh, challenge that uh, we, we are working on and we've been working on is this is uh, flow measurement, uh, which is, which is uh, always a big challenge in, in microfluidics. And uh, we are very happy to put on the market uh, a new non-invasive uh, flow measurement and control the uh, to be able to control the clothes without uh, touching the clothes, without uh, having a sterility uh, issue. So for the people here, we'll be really happy to continue with a demo and a glass of champagne and uh, some nice food. Uh, so we welcome you to join the, the, the demo staff. And uh, for the people who are following us remotely, uh, please ask for a demonstration if uh, if you are interested on one or the other or both of, uh, of our. Uh, so I thank you all, uh, and let's uh, continue uh, here, and we will close the uh, the uh, online session. Now.